Hello and welcome to the Global Forecast from the Economist Intelligence Unit. My name is Tony McMahon and as ever I'm joined by Robin Bew. Robin, the ECB has raised rates by a quarter point. Where do you see rates going from here in the Eurozone? Well, we think there's probably going to be another quarter point rise in the Eurozone and then they call a halt. Um, they're clearly concerned about you know, just inflationary pressures, but also their own credibility as a you know, relatively new central bank and need to get somewhat ahead of the curve. Um, of course, within the Eurozone, the story is extraordinarily complicated. They have a very strong economy in Germany. They have a lot of weakness in the peripheral economies and, of course, a lot of fiscal stresses and the higher interest rates are making those things worse. So the ECB is trying to balance this strength in Germany, worries about inflation, their own credibility against these fiscal problems around the edges um, and the, our sort of position on where they're at is a little bit of a rate rise. We have one, we're probably going to get another one, but then they hold pat um, and hope that growth in the peripheral starts to strengthen a bit more. So they're doing just enough to make the markets aware that they're focused on this, but not so much as to kill the economy. How do you think rate movements will impact the dollar-euro exchange rate? Well, we think that the Eurozone is still looking economically quite shaky, certainly around the edges. So, of course, higher interest rates in, the, in Europe, which we don't think are going to be matched by higher rates in, in America over the course of the next 12 months or so at least, um, might be expected to actually give a bit of support to the Euro. But when we look at what's going on around the edges, obviously Portugal has just had to have a bailout or is just asking for a bailout. Ireland and Greece already have and lots of focus on Spain and other countries. And we think the mood music around economic stability within the Eurozone is going to remain pretty negative and as a result we think the euro is going to struggle to make any substantive gains despite the fact that interest rates will be a little bit the policy will be a little bit more aggressive in Europe than we expected to be in America. So how do you see the inflation outlook? Well, of course, at the moment, high oil prices and high, high food prices are, are knocking through quite strongly in most markets, although there have been some signs, and the UK is one that perhaps inflation pressures aren't quite as, as problematic as, as some had assumed. Um, when we go out over the course of the next 12 months or so, um, we think the kick from oil prices will start to fade in terms of um, the impact on inflation. And indeed, we think oil prices will come off a little bit because we see a bit more supply coming onto the oil market. Um, and in terms of food price inflation as well, to the extent that supply issues have been behind some of the price pressures. Um, those supply issues will ease. We've seen better harvests in some markets already in Africa, for example. Um, so those things will start to ebb away. And fundamentally, we see, still see economic growth in the richer countries around the world as being relatively soft. So we think that, look out 12 months, look out 18 months, inflationary pressures will be a bit softer than they are at the moment. So right now, there's certainly a problem. Um, but we do think that the lack of demand strength in these big economies will actually allow inflationary pressures to ease. But the issue right now is of course that inflation has been very high and that does undermine the credibility of central banks and the ECB has had to do something about that. Portugal's finally admitted that it needs a financial bailout. What does this tell us about European austerity packages? Um, what they tell you, I guess it's no great surprise, that is austerity packages, um, they might cut the amount of money that governments are spending, but they also crimp growth, and that of course crimps tax revenue, and, and a lot of these countries in the periphery are finding it very, very difficult, because as they implement very aggressive fiscal programmes, um, growth of course remains very muted or indeed negative in a number of countries, and that crimps tax revenues, and therefore the budget deficit doesn't really improve very much. Um, for Portugal, who had done quite a bit relative to perhaps their more recent history, um, Portugal didn't really have much of a record in being very aggressive in terms of structural reform and managing their budget very particularly well. Um, they have become much more aggressive recently, but it clearly wasn't enough. They're going to need some support. Um, but I think the difficulty for a lot of these countries in the periphery is the need for them to keep a tight grip on the public finances is of itself crimping growth and that means that tax revenues are difficult to find and therefore it's kind of very hard to see how these budgetary positions are going to get any better which is why of course ultimately we've already seen three countries ask for help um, and there's a lot of worry that, that 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 list might expand. Are you expecting consumer confidence to take a knock in Europe and the US and what economic impact will that have? Well, lower consumer confidence, and we think it will take a knock. I mean, obviously, high energy prices, they seem to be correlated pretty tightly with consumer confidence. That's certainly been an issue in America. Um, that's going to have an impact on retail sales. And for rich economies, consumer demand is a big chunk of overall demand. So clearly, it has an impact on growth. Um, I think it's important to realize, though, that actually consumer demand was likely to be pretty soft anyway. Um, if you look to Europe, we all were already in an austerity mode. Consumers are carrying 
selling a lot of debt um, outside of Germany, consumer demand really wasn't that impressive anyway. In America, we did see stronger consumer spending, but that was largely because government fiscal policy had been pretty supportive of the consumer. But of course now the fiscal story in America has changed completely. We're into a, a sort of budget cuts type mode, um, so support for the consumer from that area is going to disappear. So we're already saying that consumer spending was going to soften and of course worries about um, higher energy prices for example just make that problem worse. So I think the story again for Europe and America is relatively soft consumer demand and that ultimately translates to soft economic growth. To what extent can Western economies export their way out of trouble? We can't all export our way out of trouble. Um, China won't buy everything that everybody makes. Um, some countries are more competitive than others. Um, and I guess the issue in, in Europe right now is that Germany is the one that looks so strong. I mean, they're competitive within the Eurozone because they kept their wages under control for a long period. Um, and they are still very competitive outside the Eurozone. And they've done very well selling um, particularly capital goods and so machinery and equipment into markets like China and other fast growing emerging economies. So they look pretty good. But some of the countries, particularly the ones that really need growth around the periphery, and they are not price competitive and often they don't even have industries which produce things that other people want to buy. So if you look to Greece, you know, what do they do is a lot of agricultural products where they're not really very price competitive. And tourism, and again within the Eurozone, they're not very price competitive there. So when, where are exports coming from for them? Not, very, not a very different story for Portugal either. Ireland's in a bit of a better place because it does have a more interesting, diverse industrial base. Their economy, of course, is in a bad state but you might hope that you can see how they might start to turn that around in terms of their industrial performance. And there are other countries that people are worried about, like Spain, which look similar to Ireland in as much as they have a more diversified economy, so you might hope that we could get a bit more traction there. But you know, I think the idea that everyone can export their way out of trouble is completely wrong, and that, that the ability to do that drops to the ones that are most competitive, and those actually the ones that, that least need the support. So Germany, I think, is a, the benefit. Do you see events in the Middle East continuing to push the price of oil upwards? Well, I guess that depends very much where we go. At the moment, all eyes are on Libya and, and we see a lot of back and forth and there's lots of talk about a stalemate and our sense that there's going to be no happy outcome in Libya, I think, in terms of, of what's going on within that particular market. Um, Libya is an important oil player, um, but it's not a very big player. It was doing about 1.6 million barrels a day prior to this, you know, during the worst of the fighting that dropped off to practically zero. Um, that kind of oil production can and is being covered by other producers, so particularly Saudi Arabia, but other markets too, like Kuwait. Um, the reason oil prices are high, of course, is that markets are concerned that the unrest that we see in Libya and, of course, that we have already seen in Egypt and Tunisia um, might spread to bigger oil producers, so people are looking at Iran, which is still a very substantial player. Of course, people look to Iraq, where recently production has been increasing, and of course, ultimately, people look to Saudi Arabia itself, which is the world's biggest exporter. That's what's worrying the markets. Now, we think that Libya will reach some kind of stalemate, and there will be a sense that unrest in the rest, the instability in the rest of the region will be kind of managed and controlled, and as a result, perhaps all market participants will get a little bit of their confidence back. And we also do expect to see more oil supply coming onto the market because of non-OPEC investment recently, and also some OPEC investment, for example, in Iraq. Um, so we do think by the end of the year, oil prices will be coming back down a bit, but that is, of course, contingent on instability in the Middle East and kind of. Um, coming to an end and if, you know, if that doesn't happen then the sky is almost the limit and of course if we started to see serious concerns about Saudi Arabia there literally is no limit to how high prices could go so it is very contingent on the Middle East um, perhaps stabilising we think it probably will um, but of course there's no guarantees there. Thank you Robin. Well that's all from the Global Forecast join us again next month for a roundup of world events until then thank you and goodbye.